a uh, bladed Merry Christmas, everyone. It's Rob Ryder, and it's Monday, December 26, 2022, which is the 2021st anniversary, birthday, of the only begotten Son of God, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It was a great day to celebrate. As part of my celebration yesterday, I went back, was going through a lot of the things I've been working on recently. Uh, to try to connect some dots and put things together and uh, do a video and try to move ahead with the process. And, uh, hey, it led to this video. So uh, I thank the Holy Ghost for that. So what's going on? Um, well, first of all, common law courts and writs in the Republic. Which, you know, there are common law courts, as it turns out. And they have the power to issue writs. And... Um, this is how, in the Republic, we can defeat the democracy, which is all the statutory bullshit and motion practice and all these other things. That really isn't common law. Common law is writs, as we'll see in just a minute. But, uh, you know, uh, before we get there, I am Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, U.S. Army veteran, also known as Rob Ryder. My email address is Court of Record at AOL.com, and you can find me on YouTube at Rob Ryder with three Bs, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R. -E Can't explain it, it just happened, you know, that I slipped an extra B in there when I was creating the, the site many, many years ago. Uh, so, a lot of this is going to be based on this one statute. This is the Common Law Statute, or Common Law Act of Congress, in the United States. It's 28 U.S.C. 1651, where it says in Section A that the Supreme Court and all courts established by an act of Congress may issue all writs necessary or appropriate in aid of their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the usages and principles of law. All right, so there's a common law court. A court that can issue all writs, right? And what court's that? Well, it's a Supreme Court or a court established by Act of Congress, which, you know, technically those, I guess we call those Article I courts. Could they be Article IV courts? I don't know if that's created by Congress or not, but I know Article I courts are. Okay, so that's the first section. And then they have this next section, which is B, that the alternative writ, which is actually, you know, that's the name of something, alternative writ. An alternative writ or rule nisi may be issued by a justice or judge of a court which has jurisdiction. So now this would be any court that you're in, that you find yourself in, you know, let's say you're the defendant or something, right? Well, that court apparently has jurisdiction. Then that court could issue this thing called an alternate writ or a thing called a rule nisi, which is technically about doing the same thing as uh, the All Writs Act does. And so we're going to explore this a little bit, and I'll show you the example of what I'm trying to do for myself, and uh, you know you can see if you can make it work for yourself. So yeah, give me just a second to load a few things up, and we can get started. Hang on here. Okay, so just real quick, right? If you go to YouTube on Rob Ryder R O B B B R Y D E R, and uh, search under videos, you would find a whole bunch of videos that I've done. Not been here before. And, uh, you know, these last two that I did, Make Way for the U.S. Navy Legal Services and this original writ for JAG and UCMJ, I really like the lead-ins for this video here that I'm doing today. So if you're trying to catch up on everything, it's a good place to start. Now, as far as, uh, you know, a court created by an act of Congress, well, Article I tribunals include Article I courts, also known as legislative courts set up by Congress to review, da 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 Da, 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 da. And now here's one. Ancillary courts with judges appointed by Article III appeal courts judges. I don't really know who that is exactly yet, but I'd like to find out. You know, because what the law said is the Supreme Court and the courts established by Congress have this authority. So I don't know that, you know, like the sixth... Circuit Appeals Court has it because it wasn't established by Congress. Right, was it? You know, what, what's established by Congress? I guess technically the only court established by the Constitution is the Supreme Court. 
Everything else is, was established by Congress. Okay, maybe something like that. But I know for sure Article One courts, right? And so here, if you go down and look at Article One tribunals, you see this list. you got the D.C. Courts of Appeals, United States Court of Appeals for Armed Forces. Hey, that could be of interest to me. Right? United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Hey, that could be of interest. So all these courts listed here, the tax court, Social Security's got a hearing office. All of these courts here have this all writs authority that they can use uh, to uh, further their um, jurisdiction or in aid of their jurisdiction. So I guess that would mean is if you had an issue with, let's say, Social Security Administration, you could go to the Social Security Administration Office of Hearings Operations and ask them to issue a writ, you know, an all writ. We'll get into what those are, right? But a writ to the Social Security to make them do something. Now, I don't know that they can issue a writ to somebody outside of Social Security, but, you know, I'm going to find out. I'm not, myself, I'm not using Social Security. I'm using this one here. Uh, United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. And as I had shown in my last video that, I had already discovered that these other appeals courts for the armed forces, that they had this all rich authority. So I was trying to, you know, file something into there to get them to do something. And uh, one of the answers I got back, and this is from the Navy, right, was that uh, because DEERS, which is D-E-E-R-S, which is an acronym for the system where they keep all the information for service members' identification, had me down as a disabled veteran, right, that they couldn't help me. All right, said, uh, that's your status on DEERS, disabled veteran. Sorry, we can't help. You know, and so I was thinking, well, okay. And I said, hey, you know what, I've, I've tried to open a case before in this uh, Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. You know, let me go look at that. And sure enough, you know, that, uh, yeah, they had the all rich jurisdiction. And for 50 bucks, you can file a petition. I said, well, yeah. I'm going to file a petition and see what happens. And that's where I am now. I'm just waiting to see what happens. This is all just before Christmas. And now we're in Christmas. And probably this week will be everybody on holiday in between Christmas. And, you know, nothing will get done until after the first of the year. But what are you going to do? So in the meantime, I'll just talk about what I did. So let's get on to it. Hang on. Okay, so we're just going to step through some history here. We're going to start with Blackstone. And what he said, you know, this is supposed to be like Blackstone's Commentaries and Laws of England, right, is the manual for common law that was used by the founders to create the United States, right? Uh, somebody had told me once that their ancestors came across, you know, the United States in the covered wagon. I think they're going to Oregon, actually. And, uh, you know, that they had two... Two sets of books. They had the Bible and Blackstone. It was the books, the only books they had in their uh, in their possession. So, anyways, you know, he had things to say about common law. We're going to use this. That this is when I say common law, I'm talking about Blackstone had to say. And if we can get the courts to agree with Blackstone, then you know everything works. And then uh, the All Writs Act, which we talked about a little bit, little bit, and then what kind of uh, powers that means. And then uh, 38 U.S.C. Chapter 72, well, this will have to do with the Court of Appeals for Veterans Affairs and the powers it has. And then uh, what we'll find out is one of the powers it has is it has this, you know, I'm going to call it superintending control, although they didn't use those words. It has superintending control over the Board of Veterans Affairs. And the Board of Veterans Affairs was set up by an executive order uh, by uh, FDR, as a matter of fact. And, uh, you know, he ordered, so he ordered the Board of Veterans Affairs to do A, B, C, and D, whatever those are. Well, the court can make sure that the board does those. And what's happening now is they're not really happening for the benefit of uh, veterans. Right, because we didn't have any coercive force to make them do it. Before that, see, before the court was created, the board had jurisdiction over law and fact. 
And now the court has jurisdiction over law and the board has jurisdiction over fact. So they have to follow the law. So yeah, it's a big deal. Okay, so before I start reading here, just give me one second. Okay, so let's begin here. Um, having, I'm not reading this whole thing, but this first paragraph here is really important. So having under the head of redress by suit in courts, right? Didn't say by case or something else, called it a suit. Pointed out in the preceding pages, in the first place, the nature and several species of courts of justice wherein remedies are administered for all sorts of private wrongs. And, in the second place, shown to which of these courts, in particular application, must be made for redress, according to a distinction of justice, or, in other words, what wrongs are cause cognizable by one court and what by another. I proceeded under the title of injuries cognizable by courts of common law to define and explain species of remedies by action provided for every possible degree of wrong or injury, as well as such remedies as are dormant and out of use as those which are everyday practice, apprehending that the reason for one would never be clearly comprehended without some acquaintance with the other. And I now, in the last place, to examine the manner in which these several remedies are pursued and applied by actions in courts of common law. These courts he's talking about up here. To which I shall afterwards subjoin and defy uh, a brief account of proceedings in the court of equity. Right? So, right, there's all sorts of courts that have all sorts of jurisdictions, and you've got to pick the right court or the right jurisdiction for whatever your matter is, right? Whatever the wrong is you're trying to take care of, and, right, then their courts have cog are cognizable, or the injury is cognizable by courts of common law. Okay, so in treating the remedies by action of common law, I shall confine myself to modern method, practice, and our courts adjudication. Uh, and that there is no injury so obstinate and inveterate by which might, in the end, be eradicated by some or other the rem remedial writs. Right? Remember, the court can issue all writs, so it can order, it can issue whatever the remedial writ is then that we would need for whatever the thing is that we're complaining about. It's just that there's a freaking way to do it. Like everything else, there's a process and a procedure. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. I don't even know what it is myself. You won't know until it works. I'm just saying, you know, because that's the way it is, then we should just try to follow the simplest procedure we can find. Uh, okay, so in that, uh, given an abstract of history, the progress uh, suit through the courts of common law. Same extract will moreover afford us a general idea of the conduct that causes the inferior courts of common law, those in cities and boroughs, and in county barren, hundred and count, or county courts. See, those could all be courts of common law. But as we'll see, there's courts of common law that are like the royal courts, and then there's courts of common law for injuries that are less than 40 shillings, four zero shillings, whatever that is. So, um, you know, you may not want that court. If, you're, if your problem's more than 40 shillings, well, you don't want the county court. You need the royal court. And there's only one way to get that, and that's with this original writ. So the most natural, and uh, considering the subject for us, uh, okay, he just basically says he's going to show us the way this works. The general, therefore, and orderly parts of a suit are these, right? This is the, this is the orderly part of doing a common law suit. And number one, starts an original writ. So we can just stop right now. If you didn't go do this first, you're not ever going to get to common law. Court can't help you. You have to have an original writ. Right? And there's a process to get the original writ. But for us, that is the process. We have to get number one done. And if we do number one, we're not going to have all these other ones afterwards because we're never going to go to trial because these people can't go to trial for the shit they did. You know, they're going to have to fix it ahead of time. Right? Fix the errors in the records. 
which is basically what this is. See, if we get a writ that says you need to fix the errors in the records or come to court and tell the court why you didn't, well, then there's a good chance they're going to fix the records. And so this isn't just for a veteran. This would be, you know, for anybody who's got an issue because the issue is that we have errors in records and we haven't found a way to fix the errors. If the errors weren't in the records, we wouldn't have a fucking problem. And they're intentional errors. They're put in there by esquires, ground agents, who make sure there's errors and omissions in official records that benefit, you know, the public instead of the person. And yes, I said person. You are a person. Don't let anybody tell you different. In common law, you're a person. Statutory law, they may have all these other kinds of persons, but the definition of a person is a human being. The union of a spirit and a human body. That's a person. It's like, you know, God is three persons. One God. Right? Three persons, that's what it says. I ain't, I'm not... Don't let anybody tell you you're not a person. Don't listen to them. If you're listening to that, you're already wrong. You're going down, you're going to end up in a ditch. So first then, of the original or original writ, which is the beginning and found, or foundation of a suit. Duh. Right? If you don't do step one, it doesn't matter if you did two through seven, correct, or eight. There won't, well, there won't be an eight. The, or, or the execution will be, you know, uh, was denied. But I don't think he can even get to number two until you have number one, because this is the part to do in a suit in common law, and you have to start with number one. First then, uh, original writ. Uh, person receives an injury he thinks worthwhile to demand satisfaction. He is to consider with himself to take advice of what redress the law uh, has given for the injury, and therefore make it uh, application suit to the crown. The foundation of all justice, for which particular specific remedy which he is determined, advised to pursue. And then it talks about money on a bond, action of debt, goods obtained, da 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 da. All these things, you know, you could go get an original writ for. Or any consequential injury received, a special action on the case. There you go. They got, uh, yeah, they call them uh, action on the case. They have trespass and trespass on the case. Uh, so to this end, he is to sue out or purchase by paying, I think it's the stated fees, but it says he, he stated fees, an original or original writ from a court, the court of chancery, which is the official shop of justice, shop or men of justice, wherein the king's writs are framed. Right, the court of chancery was the keeper of the king's conscience. Actually, the chancellor was, but he was in charge of the court of chancery. In a mandatory letter from the king on parchment, uh, seal this great seal, direct the sheriff of the county there, and uh, injury is committed, it's supposed to be, requiring him to command the wrongdoer to either do the justice or else appear in court and answer the accusation against him. So, you know, basically we're talking about a show cause. But the thing is, it's not called a show cause. If you call it a show cause, you just made it statutory. It's not the common law name. That's the way I see it, because we're going to see they, you know, they use specific names for these things. We had best do a Blackstone set if we're trying to get into common law. Because this whole thing about the letter, that's not what we're going to do. That's what the court's going to do. We're going to tell them we need this, and they're going to give it to us. And they're going to address it to the sheriff and da 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 That's what the court's going to do. All right? We just need to get the damn, you know, the petition for redress of grievances into the right court that has jurisdiction over the subject matter. Uh, okay, however, so here we go. However, in small actions below the value of 40 shillings, which are brought in the court bearer in the county court, no royal writ is necessary. There's not an original writ, but there's a plaint. And guess what comes with plaints? Plaintiffs. Right? You see plaintiff on paper, you're in the wrong court. Now, you may be in that. So now here's the thing. Now, you may be in that court. And as we saw in the writ, right, that an alternative writ or rule nisi may be issued by a justice or judge of a court which has jurisdiction. So, you know, you can 
I'm saying that we can use that for any reason, and we'll get to that in a second. But it isn't necessarily where you want to start a case, but if you already find yourself in a case as the defendant, then that judge or justice should be able to issue, you know, the uh, alternative writ, they called it, or the rule nisi, and you can already see a rule nisi is, you know, it's a different word, right? Rule's not a writ. So of the two, I'd say, well, I want an alternative writ, you know, because that'd be the common law thing. Uh, yada, yada. So I don't want to read this whole thing. It just takes too long, right? But but there are some important parts, so I think we just spoke on it. So now, indeed, now here's the important thing. Now, indeed, even the rich, uh, the royal rich are held to be demandable of common right on paying the usual fees for any delay in granting them or setting an unusual or exorbitant price upon them would be a breach of Magna Carta. Right? So to none will we sell, to none deny, to none delay either right or justice. So you tell the court, this is why you have to issue the writ. Because it would be a violation of Magna Carta not to. And yeah, that should have matters here in the United States because it's common law. Um, there's only like a few statutes in all of common law. This was, it was in Illinois. And uh, there's a particular uh, revised statute that talks about common law and what can be used. There's, it, it mentions like three statutes of English common law that uh, are, un, are not allowed in, in Illinois. And like one of them, Henry VIII. I mean, that's how far back they go, saying, yeah, you can use common law. Go all the way back to Henry VIII, but you can't use this one. I think there's one from, maybe it's uh, it's probably Elizabeth and Anne, or Anne or Elizabeth, I can't remember which one. And, uh, you know, very few that weren't included. Very interesting. So original writs are either optional or preemptory, or, in the language of our law, they are either precipi, or if you give him security. The precipi is the alternative is in the alternative. Oh, hey, there's an alternative writ commanding the defendant to do something required or show the reason wherefore he has not done it. That is the alternative writ. Okay, uh, the writ was drawn up in the form of precipi or command to do thus or show cause to the contrary with the defendant his choice to redress or injury or stand the suit. So, that's the basis. This is the, you know, the power came from Congress. And this is kind of how uh, this all rich statute and injunctive power of a single appellate judge came into being. So, if you wanted to, to download this, you could, right? It's just called all rich stat, uh, statute. An injunctive power of a single appellate judge. You put in just some of that, I'm sure you'll find it. Michigan Law Review. Google will have it pop right up in front of you. So, um, the all writ statute, an injunctive power of a single appellate judge. We're not going to get quite that far into the injunctive power. Right now, I'm just dealing with a writ. So, in federal court system, the power of the judiciary to issue writs which are formal orders requiring responsive action, right? They have to do something. Can't just sit there and do nothing. Act like they didn't hear. Is embodied in a single legislative provision, Section 1651 of Title 28, United States Code. Excuse me, also known as the All Writ Statute. And uh, we saw what it said, right? That the uh, Supreme Court and all courts established by an act of Congress may issue all writs necessary and appropriate aid in respect of jurisdictions, da 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 Or an alternative writ or rule, Nisi, right? That doesn't say or, it just goes to be, but that is a or. By a justice or judge of a court which has jurisdiction, which is the court that you find yourself in as a defendant. They said they got jurisdiction. Well, then they can issue the writ. Now, because Section 1651 is general in its terms and incorporates by reference the whole body of common law regarding writs, right? Well, there you go. Whole body of common law regarding writs is covered in that one act. 
that one little phrase. Determining its proper function is uh, sometimes been difficult. The proper scope of the statute's broader section, 1651A, has been much more clearly delineated uh, than has Section B, even though the later, by comparison, appears to be quite limited application. Indeed, while the role of uh, Subsection A as a, an interlocutory review has truly been debated, almost no analytical discussion or uh, a subsection B has, are, are to be found. Right? They haven't talked about B very much for whatever reason, and they only talk about A as far as doing a review, like a uh, uh, writ of certiary, which is a royal writ. And it's, you know, it's say all writs, one of them writs, but it's the one that was issued. <clears throat> and uh, just to jump off real quick, there was a case way back in the days called Marbury versus Madison, M-A-R-B-U-R-Y, Marbury versus Madison. And it's well known because it's supposed to be the court that established judicial review. But it doesn't really talk about what was being judicially reviewed. And what it was, was uh, there was going from one administration to another. And it's during the time when they called it the uh, uh, Midnight Judges Act where whoever was the president at the time, just before, you know, in his lame duck time, appointed a whole bunch of judges. And uh, he signed and sealed their commissions and left them on the table. And the new administration came in, and they wouldn't issue the frickin' writs. And so it's not signed, sealed, delivered. The deal wasn't done. So these people could not say that they were a judge because they didn't have their, you know, certificate. That's the whole, you know, and this is, we still have this problem. People, they don't have the certificate. But, you know, it was a big deal. They didn't have their certificate. And so they took it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court issued a writ of mandamus for it to be issued. And then somebody said, well, we want to have that reviewed because we don't see in the Constitution where the Supreme Court has writ jurisdiction. It's not written in to, this, to the Constitution. And they had it reviewed, and the whoever the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was agreed with them and said, no, the Supreme Court doesn't have that freaking jurisdiction. Sorry, can't do it for you. Now, since then, they've worked it out that they got it, but at the time, they didn't have it. And, but what they did find out was that the guy could go, that these guys who should have been uh, appointed judges who are trying to get their freaking certificate issued to them, could go to the court in D.C., which had previously been Maryland, which had been a common law jurisdiction. And so this court was, they said, was common law jurisdiction. And have that court issue the mandamus to the president who's in D.C. to do the thing that needed to be done to give these people their, um, their uh, commission. Now, it may have been a timing. They may have figured that out after the fact or something. I don't know exactly what it was. But at the time, this was what was all going on. And the whole idea about this Marbury versus Madison having judicial review, the thing they were re reviewing at the time was, did the Supreme Court have the authority to issue a mandamus? And it came out that, no, they didn't. Right? That, that was something that's uh, given by Congress. So, but somehow they got around it. You know, I, I'm not going to go through the whole history. Just that's kind of what happened, right? So, uh, so anyways, although 1651 was enacted in uh, 1948, the statutory language of subsection A can be traced all the way back to the Judiciary Act of 1789, right? So apparently, in 1789, the Judiciary Act it says that federal courts have uh, all rich jurisdiction. Uh, let's just, I want to read a couple of these, read between the line parts here, right? So, uh, section 1651, however, confers upon federal courts the general common law writ power. I'm not going to argue with it. it. says it right there. Then they should be able to issue me any common law writ I might need. Now, the thing about common law in Chancery was there were certain writs that had names, right? And so... Those are, you know, the common types that everybody might need. They already had them written up. But if you went in with your own particular problem, they would write a writ up for your issue. Right? And, you know, and then enforce it. 
Uh, okay, so it has been suggested, for example, that the power of the Supreme Court to issue uh, some 1651 writs is greater than that of the Courts of Appeals, which owe their existence to a statute rather than to the Constitution. Fair enough. One might uh, anal uh, anal analogize the specific writ power to contempt, of, uh, uh, contempt power, which uh, some have suggested is inherent in con uh, concept of a court. If the analogy is valid, then the very establishment of a court by a legislature would include a grant of writ power. Well, I guess we're not disagreeing. That's what they said it was. If, it's, if your court has been established by an act of Congress, then you have all writ jurisdiction, at least within the jurisdiction, whatever it is you have jurisdiction over. Right? So the uh, court for... Uh, Court of Appeals for Veterans has jurisdiction over the uh, Board of Veterans Affairs, which by its own uh, creation has a whole bunch of duties to veterans that aren't being uh, enforced. One of the ones that can do it is the court. Uh, it's clear the phrase all writs uh, encompasses the common law writs and mandamus, prohibition, certiary, also includes injunctions, subpoenas, Writs of no exit, which that's put somebody in jail, right? They can issue, a, they can issue a writ and have somebody put in jail. And writs of habeas corpus, you know, da 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 da. It's a big deal. Federal appeal uh, appellate court can correct errors without waiting for final disposition of the case of an appeal, right? So it just seems to me, well, there must be some way that you know, the, like the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals can do this. So, you know, because not everybody is a veteran. Not everybody has a Social Security issue. Not everybody has these particular issues. But the, you know, the court with overall jurisdiction or general jurisdiction is the uh, district court filed by the Circuit Court of Appeals. So it's like the Circuit Court of Appeals should be able to issue the writ to the district court, just like the Court of Appeals for Veterans can issue the writ to the uh, uh, Board of Veterans Affairs. And we'll find out. I'm sure somebody will try it. Let's find out. <clears throat> so, okay, hang on a second. Yeah, because it said this. So, however, hints of a more positive approach to the use of 1651A for review of interlocutory orders are found as early as the landmark case of Ex Parte, Peru, uh, da, 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 318 U.S. Uh, 578, which held that even if an eventual right of an appeal exists, a 1651A extraordinary writ can nevertheless issue. The Supreme Court declared that the issuance of such writs is not a question of power, but rather one of discretion. A broad scope of the power is assumed, and when the action below is sufficiently extraordinary, the court may exercise its discretion and issue the writ. Well, I'm going to say, well, Blackstone said you got to issue the writ because, you know, it's a common right, so issue the writ. Because the court that can issue the writ is the district court. You don't have the power. Now, it may have the power to issue... Um, what was that here? This alternative writ and rule Nisi, but it doesn't have the power to issue all writs. And we're talking about all writs, right? The thing that could be written specifically to take care of your issue. So, okay, continue on. A little bit more here. So, uh, okay, it was early 1789. That's when the first part came into being. It is clear, however, that both the alternative writ, right, that's the praecipe, and the rule nisi are granted on motions ex parte are, are and are in the nature of show cause orders. Right, well, that may be true, but one's a writ and one's a rule, so they're not the same jurisdiction. These writs were at one time used in place of modern summons or process. 
right? So these writs, we're talking about now, we're talking about the alternative writ, were one time, at one time used in place of modern summons or process and also served as a means of framing the issues to be contested before the court of either original or appellate jurisdiction. All right, so you write your petition up. It frames what the issue is. That's what we're going to argue, right? And so now that that's been established, the respondent can either, well, do what it said to satisfy the petitioner, right? In other words, get rid of the grievance or come into court, show cause why you're not going to. And that's done with this thing called the uh, um, alternative writ. So these writs were at one time used in place of modern summons or process and also served as a means of framing issues to be contested before a court of either original or appellate jurisdiction. Functionally, the two writs were closely related, and the use of the word or in the statute suggests that Congress may have viewed them as interchangeable to some extent. Their operation is simple. Once a rule nisi is obtained, notice is served on the party against whom redress is sought to show cause why the request for relief should not be granted. So, you know, if you can figure out how to get a rule nisi done, well, you could use that, right? But because it's a rule, to me, I said, well, it's not common law. Now we're going to a statutory rule of some kind. I'd rather stick with common law, you know, and so we'll continue reading. But this is one way. So once a rule nisi is obtained, notice is served on the party against whom redress is sought to show cause why the requested relief should not be granted. After a hearing, argument proceeds as upon ordinary motion. Right now we're back into motion practice and having hearings and going, 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 and except that it is the party showing cause rather than the party who brought uh, about the issuance of the writ who is entitled to open the cause, uh, open and close. If the party who secured the rule nisi prevails or if the party defaults, the rule is made final and the requested remedy is granted. That's one way to do it. So although the alternative writ, which originated with ancient writ precipi, is used in the United States mainly in connection with the writ of uh, preemptory, final mandamus, the two are to be contrasted. The alternative mandamus was once the prevalent initial step to take by one wishing to obtain a preemptory mandamus. So, hey, they got two different kinds of mandamuses. You got, you know, the show cause one, as we'll see, and then you have the final one. So, it is a uh, direction to the party against whom it is issued either to undertake some act or else appear and show cause why the act need not be done. Right? That's an alternative mandamus. It's not final. It's not telling them to do it only. It's saying do it or come in and tell us why you're not going to. If sufficient cause is not shown at the hearing, a uh, preemptory mandamus requiring performance will be issue. So you don't have a big court case. You're not going to argue it. They're going to come in for one hearing and if they can't establish sufficient cause for not doing it, then they're going to be ordered to do it. Considering this historical background, it appears the selection of 1651, or section 15, 1651, contemplates a two-step procedure with regard to alternative writs and rule nisi. The first step, issuance of show cause order, can be undertaken by a single judge or justice by virtue of subsection B. But the second step, consideration of merits of the movement's claim and issuance of a preemptory writ or absolute rule, is for a properly constituted court within the meaning of subsection A. And that means a tribunal, three people, right? This is the difference between... A one-person judge is a summary judgment, and a three-person judge is, uh, you know, they call it court of appeals. That's a final judgment. And the only one bigger than that is an end bank, and that's what you go to the Supreme Court for. Right? When you go to the appeals court, they're going to have a three, apparently they're going to have a three-person uh, court. <clears throat> 
So this conclusion is bolstered by the fact that it appears that any writ authorized by subsection A would be issued after proceedings are commenced by means of an alternative writ or rule nisi. So in either case, it starts with, you know, an alternative writ. Therefore, unless such two-step procedure were intended, an anomalous situation would exist. A party desiring a preemptory writ of mandamus to a trial judge, for example, could either obtain it directly from a three-judge panel of a court of appeals under subsection A. So there's one way to get it. If you could get them to have a panel and make the decision themselves, they can just give you the final writ or by indirection from one of the three judges if the petitioner chooses to seek first an order under subsection B, calling upon his adversary to show cause why the writ should not issue. Right? Do it or issue, or, you know, come in and say why are you not going to do what the writ says. But that's the final writ. You still had to get the you know, the uh, alternative writ. Because show cause nature of 1651B writs, no substantive rights are finally determined merely by the issuance of such a writ. A person against whom one of these writs is directed is not required to alter his behavior until he has failed to show cause. This relative impotence of a show cause order of a kind issued under 1651B should be contrasted with the effect of a superficially related writ, the temporary restraining order. Although a temporary restraining order can be a first step towards securing a preliminary or permanent injunction and is obtained ex parte, it commands the person against whom it is issued immediately to do or refrain from doing some act. Right? Not come in and show cause, just stop doing it now. Conformity to its directive is required even before an adversary hearing on the merits of a petitioner's prey for relief. Its issuance is actually an exercise of the court's injunctive power. Now, before I forget, because I don't know if I'm going to read far enough into here, it's going to say in here that a single court judge cannot issue an injunction. It has to be a three court judge. Somebody I know just had uh, a temporary restraining order put against him, right, by a one court judge. Well, according to this, he can't do that. You don't have that power. So what you'd have to do now is go to the court that can tell him he doesn't have the power to do that. Right? And get an alternative writ having the guy that did it come in and explain how he did it if he doesn't have the power. Right? Like he doesn't have the oath of office or whatever the reasons are. Tick, 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 tick. Have him come in and answer. If he can't answer the questions, then he didn't have the power. Right? That's what your alternative writ would get him to have to do. Either cancel the fucking thing or come in and answer why you did it. And if you can't, then, uh, you know, your ass is going to hang, judge. So this important distinction between the first phase in an alternative writ and rule DC process and a temporary restraining order has seemingly been ignored in several recent opinions in which individual judges of circuit courts of appeals have relied on Section 651B as an authority for granting temporary restraining orders. Although it is clear that such an order will issue under 1651A, that provision grants its powers to the Supreme Court and other courts. Right? Courts of common law. Not courts that only have, you know, or courts that have all writ jurisdiction. Not courts that only have alternative writ and rule nisi jurisdiction. So, you know, like here in Michigan, I'd be like the circuit court. I don't know. Who, who gets the restraining orders? Right? Whatever court it is. Doesn't really matter. Maybe that's the, maybe that's actually at the district court. And you could then go to the circuit court and ask for an alternative writ. Uh, how come this judge was allowed to issue a freaking uh, temporary restraining order? Right? When he doesn't have the authority according to federal law. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, so hey, you can see what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I can't read all this stuff, but you know, I'd be forever trying to get through this. So, um, let me see. The writ precipice 
was one of the first original writs, right? So what's an original writ? One of the first ones? A writ praecipe. A writ praecipe was one of the first original writs used by the Crown to initiate proceedings in its courts. I uh, see generally Kimball, introduction to the legal system. Hey, you know what? I went on after I read this last night and found a copy um, by Kimball. I put in Kimball, introduction to the legal system. I got a copy coming to me. Well, we'll see what it has to say on pages 68 to 70 whenever it shows up. Um, and then Blackstone, ta-da! It's clear, however, that the alternative writ is no longer required preliminary step in obtaining a uh, preemptory mandamus so long as the party against whom the remedy is sought has notice. Okay, well, one way to give them notice instead of doing trying to file what, you know, because when you're trying to give notice, that means you're in the court and unless it's as, as simple as putting a notice in the court case, which it could be, you know, it may be just as easy to, to go get the preliminary, the alternative writ first, because that's what <laughs> that's what's going to give the due notice. Say, here's your writ, dude. You need to do this or show up to court and sign and tell why you're not going to. And uh, so, you know, I'm trying to use this for the fact that. There's all sorts of errors in my uh, VA records or the records that are shared between the VA and the DOD. And uh, it's keeping me from being seen in the proper status, the jurisdiction that I should be seen in. But I have, you know, these other issues like the fact that um, some videos before the election, I was showing that, you know, again, I did the same thing back in 2020 that it's very specific in the Michigan election law that, you know, if you want to be an elector in an election, you have to be registered in the jurisdiction. And to do that, you have to fill out an application. And the application has statements you have to swear to, and you're supposed to swear to them before the registration clerk that registers electors. So it's a whole different thing than what they do with voters, where you just fill out a piece of paper, sign your name under penalty of perjury, it's not an oath, and it says you got to take an oath. you got to swear to it. So, it, you know, it's specific what has to happen, and they don't do that. And I had mentioned how, you know, that in 1968 they had gone from, uh, the Supreme Court had said that, uh, you, that all the districts, we'll call them, that were going to vote on um, particular issues, they had to be one man, one vote. And it was based on this case in uh, Mar uh, not Marbury, Madison. It was uh, Avery versus uh, Midland County, Texas, where Avery lived in Midland, city of Midland, which is in Midland County, Texas. It had like eighty thousand people, right? And it made up the like one of the four uh, districts of the county. So that county or that district had eighty thousand people. And between the other three districts, they had like maybe 4,000 people. So obviously his vote was much more watered down in a vote of 80,000 than it was of this other. So they said, no, you can't do that. All these districts that are going to vote on issues, they have to be one man, one vote. And by doing that, that made the township system that was in Michigan uh, no longer could work because not all townships are equally populated. And so then they went to this thing called the district commissioners. And now, like in my county, there's 19 commissions or 19 districts. Well, what they did is they made the county into a municipality. And each of those districts is a, um, a precinct, a voting precinct. But they won't let you register. right? So this, all that to say, well, they won't let you register. So I'm going to try to get that fixed. I'm going to make them register me. Kent County, uh, as a qualified registered elector of the county, just like it says, to do in the state's uh, election law. Let's see if they like that. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Uh, just a few more things, just because they all go together. So, Okay, so in my case, and I said, okay, I'm going to go to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. And uh, so I'm reading this whole thing, and nowhere in here does it talk about all writs jurisdiction. 
it does talk, use the word writ a couple times about having the power to enforce its writs and by the power of contempt. So if they can issue a writ, you know, it's going to be enforced by their contempt. But it doesn't talk about all writs jurisdiction. What it talks about is their exclusive jurisdiction, which they've been given because they're handling veterans' claims. But it's almost like, you know, well, if uh, if all writs is common law, then as long as I am a veteran, then I am a subject to this court, and this court should be able to issue any writ that I need for any freaking reason. Whether it has to do with the VA or not, it could have to do with the city, or it could have to do with, uh, you know, whomever it is, that I always have jurisdiction in this court. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I may try to do what I just said about the election thing with this court and just file another case and pay another 50 bucks and tell them what it is I want to have done and see if they'll make them the, uh, um, make them the uh, respondent. Because one of the great things is in the, the rules of the court, the second rule is that the court can, uh, you know, disregard all its rules. It can do whatever the hell it needs to. And I believe that in common law that, you know, it has common law jurisdiction throughout the land. All federal courts have common law jurisdiction, so they're all working together. Okay. And uh, finally, just to stop with this, just to show how this tie-in goes. So, you know, they created this thing called the uh, United, States court of, uh, United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. And it has jurisdiction over this thing called the Board of Veterans' Appeals. And that came into place in 1968, or 1988, is when they passed the act. And then this guy, who was the secretary, um, you know, who was he here? Oh, he was the chairman. I believe he's the chairman of the uh, Board of uh, Veterans' Appeals, making a report. And so it's just good to see this. Now, this is really for veterans, so pay attention, veterans. So the Board of Veterans' Appeals, BVA or board, is a component of the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is responsible for entering the final decision on behalf of the Secretary and each of the many thousands of claims of it for entitlement to veterans' benefits that are present, presented annually for appellate review. Right? So that's its, uh, you know, it's... Main function is um, appellate review. The board's mission is set forth in this particular sector to conduct hearings and consider and dispose of appeals properly before the board in a timely manner and to issue quality decisions in compliance with requirements of law. So this is, you know, this is an and. One of them is to do this, conduct hearings, that's one, and to issue quality decisions in compliance with the requirements of law, including the president, uh, presidential decisions of the United States Court of Veterans' Appeals. Well, if they decide by a mandamus that this board has to do something, then, then the board has to do it. The board renders final decisions on all appeals for entitlement to veterans' benefits, including claims for entitlement to service connection. I'm claiming that. I'm claiming I'm still in the service. I have a connection to the service. But they want to say because you're a veteran and you've been discharged from the military. And that just isn't the truth. And so if you go a little, if you're to put verification on, uh, or determine veteran status, right, Google that, you can probably find this one from the VA. And uh, this brief explains the Center of Verification who the Center for Verification and Evaluation considers a veteran for the purpose of Veteran First Contracting Program. So 13 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, uh, 12 or 125.11, says a veteran, capital V veteran, has the meaning given the term in 38 U.S.C. 101, which is definition, so definition 2, period. So that's one. Or a reserve, and it doesn't say or, but a reservist or member of the National Guard called a federal active duty or disabled 
from a disease or injury incurred or aggravated in line of duty or while in training status also qualifies as a veteran, lowercase v. Right, the term veteran means a person who served in the active military, who served in the active military, naval or uh, air service, and who was discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than honorable, a uh, dishonorable, excuse me. Well, that just sounds like two different things, right? Because if you're a reservist, you haven't been discharged, you're a reservist. National Guard, you haven't been discharged, you're a reservist, or you're still in the military. This says you've been, uh, who served in active military, serv military, naval, or air service, and who was discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than dishonorable. That didn't say active duty, it said active military. Because that, you know, there's, you can still be active in the military and not be on active duty. And so, you know, there's more than one definition. One is you're out. The other one is, well, you're not out. You're either a reserve or a member of the National Guard or you've been disabled or, you know, all these other things. And I'm saying, well, I'm one of those. And the reason I say it is, well, because the things that would have taken for me to actually have been uh, released from the military never happened. Simply put, I don't have a discharge order. I have a discharge certificate, but my discharge certificate says that I was discharged from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. But my DD-4, the agreement that I signed to go in, says I was going into the Armed Forces of the United States. Well, the Armed Forces of the United States is not the Armed Forces of the United States of America. So I don't care if you say I was discharged from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. I'm still in the Armed Forces of the United States. I have a contract. So, you know, I still have a service uh, connection. Right? I, as, do, as does every other veteran. All right, so well, how did this all come about? Well, there was an executive order, right, in 1933 by FDR. Uh, the previous patchwork had said eliminate all... To eliminate a, and all questions of entitlement to benefits were subject to a single panel to the Veterans uh, Administrative Veterans Affairs. Uh, 1933, President Roosevelt created the Board of Veterans Appeals by Executive Order 6230, Veterans Regulation Number 2A. The Board has delegated the authority to render the final decision on appeal for the administrator and organizationally was directed directly responsible to the administrator. The board was charged to provide every possible assistance to claims to claimants and to take final action, which would be fair to the veteran as well as the government. Right, so that's what the law says, but that isn't necessarily what the board's doing. But the one that can make them do that would be the court because it has, you know, superintendent control. There is a thing called writ of superintendent superintendent control. You know, I'm trying not to name the writs. I just want to say the problem is. Let the freaking court write the writ how they want to write it, call it whatever they need to call it, but, you know, take care of my issue. But they, there is a writ for superintendent control, which they could say, we're taking over, and this is what you're going to do. And, you know, they just become the boss and tell the worker bees to go do whatever they've been told to do. And when they have done it and it's all been done, well, I'll go back to whatever else you were doing. So... Um, that's good stuff. Then the passage of the Veterans Judicial Review Act, which established U.S. Court of Veterans Appeals, which is now the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, um, you know, is the, the most revolutionary change in the education system since the inception of the board in 1933. Decisions by the court have been profound impact on the board as it is actually seeks ways to adapt the new interpretations of veterans' laws and designs and implemented new procedure required to meet the rapidly evolving requirement of the law. Few, if any, decisions of the court have resulted in improvement in decision productivity, timeliness, or VA adjudication system. Well, that's just because they're not asking for the right thing. Additionally, the VJRA made a hearing for, uh, okay, so the board can travel. 
uh, the VGR, so they could bring the board to you, right? The VGR say, you can take a board, go to that guy's house, and get the shit figured out. Hold the board right at your house. Or in the township hall, or wherever the hell they could hold it at. And the VGR, VGRA removed the historic $10 limitation on fees, which may be charged by attorneys at law and claimants' agents who represent VA claimants. The act gave the board original jurisdiction to review agreements for payment for such fees. And because this video is already over an hour, I'm getting tired of talking. I do want to say what they did. Right? They got rid of the $10 limit, and they made it so that the board can uh, authorize an agreement between a veteran and an attorney at law to pay the attorney at law up to 20% of any back pay that he gets for the veteran. And that, you know, that the back pay will be held out of the back pay of the veteran and paid by the board to the attorney. Okay, well, we're talking found money, brother. It's like, you know, when I read this, so I'm going to go talk to an attorney, which is another thing I've done. I'd already put the case in myself, right, because I read the other parts, but you know, I started getting back in the meat and potatoes a little more. So, well, shit, I'm going to go talk to an attorney. And, well, we'll see how that goes. I haven't actually talked to him yet, but I found one. He's a uh, Marine, right? Spent 10 years in the Marines. So, you know, maybe he's a Cornelius the Centurion instead of a full-blown uh, Crown Esquire. And as long as he is, then, you know, he can provide the three or four little, you know, details that we don't know that the thing gets in the right place and make it all happen. And even if he gets 20%, this is the thing. If you go to the Court of Appeals, the Veteran Court of Appeals, you can uh, file for, um, under the Equal Access to Justice Act, to have your attorney fees paid. So if the attorney fees were 20% of whatever they got, then... You'll get 20%. You'll get that amount back through the um, Equal Access to Justice Act. Because, you know, when you go to do this petition, the attorney isn't representing you. He's your counsel. Right? You're representing yourself. This is all in personam jurisdiction. So, you know, you, you are your attorney. Or, if you can say, okay, well, the attorney fees were this much. That's why I had to pay the attorney to get this done. And, it's, you know, and it was agreed to by the board. Well, then the court can agree to it, too, and they can reimburse you the 20%. You still get 100%. That lawyer gets his 20%. He, you know, did an honest day's work, got an honest day's pay. I'm happy to give it to him. I'd like to give him something to do besides screw people. You know, let them do the freaking paperwork. So, because this stuff has to be done in a particular manner, because words matter, right? Case and suit aren't the same word. So, is it a case? Is it a suit? Is it a proceeding? You know, da 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 da. It's all the, uh, it's, you know, that's what they went to school for. I don't need to know it. I just need to know I have relief, or that I'm owed relief, and know to go where to get it. Anyways, let's see how that part works out. I mean, that's the, I'm trying it on my own anyways. but um, And I'll do another video on all that separate from this because these just take too long to do. And um, We'll see what happens next. Let me, sure, let me make sure there's not a few more things I want to tell you. Hang on. Uh, just one little more detail. So in the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, they got a website. You go search on it. You can find it. And then they got all their different, you know, procedures and rules and so forth. And they had this one called Internal Operating Procedures, which says the IOPs are proclamated pursuant to some section of Title 38, which provides the proceedings of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims shall be conducted in accordance with such rules of practice and procedure as the court prescribes. Okay, well, what exactly does that mean for us? One of the things that covered then is, well, this is how we're going to handle petitions for extraordinary writs. The policy being petitions for extraordinary writs, right before I called it uh, extraordinary relief in its 
uh, in its rules, it calls it extraordinary relief. Here it calls it extraordinary writs, which is what they are. Generally are assigned to a screening judge in the normal course, except that for judicial efficiency purposes, the process of assignment of subsequent appeals will also apply to subsequent petitions. Right? Because so they're going to give it to one judge, right? Give it to a screening judge. It'd be like, you know, doing the alternative writ. Goes to one judge first, uh, unless there's a problem, and it needs to get the the final uh, mandamus, right? Because first you do a preliminary mandamus, and if the people take care of the issue, there is no reason to get a final mandamus. But if they come for a suit, and there's going to be a final mandamus, then you got to go to the three-court judge, or the three-judge court, and have them issue the final mandamus. But it can start with a single judge, alternative writ uh, proceeding. So what's the procedure? Well, a petition for extraordinary writ may be granted by a single judge, or based on the criteria of uh, Frankl, uh, Frankl, by a panel. Before the court grants extraordinary relief, the respondents will be afforded the opportunity to respond or to show cause why the petition should not be granted. Well, that's exactly what an alternative writ is. It's a writ of mandamus with a chance to respond to the court. All right? So it's not saying you got to stop yet. It's saying you've got to come to court, explain your position, and then we're going to tell you if you got to stop. Or you could just stop, you know, now and not come to court. If you find out, oh, hey, there is an error on the record. I wonder how that got there. Let's go ahead and fix some errors real quick and give the man his pay. Well, then pff, I'm happy, court's happy, VA workers are happy, right? Some Somebody pretending to be a, a public officer might not be so happy, but that's their problem. And proceedings on petition generally are given priority by the court, right? So if you want to get something done by the court, you've got to file a petition. Petitions get priority. And I'm sure that's the same in all the courts. You know, this is a, this is common law. This is Blackstone 101, Book 3, Chapter 18, Pursuit of Remedies by Action and First of the Original Writ. And the first original writ was a praesipi, and a praesipi was a mandamus with order to show cause attached to it. I mean, the writ of mandamus already existed. Right, so this was a separate writ. I say, okay, well, before we get to that, we're going to give you a chance to take care of it ahead of time. So that's where we are now. And uh, I'll tell you how my case is going here in a little bit. Okay. I don't think I had anything else. And, and uh, that's it for today. Common law courts and writs in the Republic. This is how we're going to defeat the democracy. We're going to make them have to answer. Fix it. Or answer. Very good. Y'all have a great day.